Right. Well, what I thought would be interesting is uh, if you look at the debate on freedom of speech and what's gone wrong, <clears throat> it tends to uh, understandably characterise itself, sorry, my voice, <clears throat> it tends to characterise itself in cultural terms. We ask questions about woke, how woke has happened and whatever. I'm very happy to talk about that. I've got some ideas, I'm sure. Uh, how many people here are familiar with the work published in The Atlantic of Jonathan Haidt? He is the one who writes the classic material linking the growth of woke to specific developments in the iPhone. Um, and there is very little doubt, for example, that the whole of uh, I'm a living experience, uh, uh, my enemies would wish that I weren't, um, in other words, dead. Uh, the, the whole business of the pylon of cancellation is due to specific iPhone features linked to specific features on Twitter. And again, all of that. I don't want to talk about it. I'm happy to uh, branch out into that. I want to look at something else, because it seems to me the most important thing that we've all got to understand is that woke is not popular. That if one were to do, and indeed many surveys have been done, the number of people, A, who recognise the word, B, subscribe to die, diversity, inclusion and equality and all the rest of it, is a tiny, tiny portion of the population. So the key issue is, how is an extraordinary minority taken over and established control. Now, as a historian, of course, I'd be the first to say, and by the way, as a historian who in theory believes in democracy, but I actually think most change, and again, this is a very interesting illustration of the fact, most change comes from small groups. It's not the conversion of the mass, it's the takeover. In other words, this is standard Pareto theory of elites, right? But why, the question you've always got to ask is, what does the elite capture? Or what are the institutional, you can tell I'm used to lecturing, what are the institutional circumstances that empower it, right? And what I'm interested in, and what I'm going to talk about this evening, is what I think has changed, and I'm going to address it specifically to Britain. If you go to America, there is a different set of institutional circumstances, which are very much related to the revolution, to the founding fathers, to the importance in America, and the arguable importance in America, of doctrines of universal human rights. Are they actually central to the Constitution, or is this a perversion of the Constitution? Uh, there's an entire uh, group of theorists in America who argue that the idea that universal human rights were central to the revolution is in fact a derailment of a proper understanding. Uh, uh, whereas, of course, you will find the notion of, hum of universal human rights extraordinarily prominent in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. It's not carried through into the Constitution. But nevertheless, America, partly from Gettysburg, partly uh, from, the, uh, from the Civil War, more particularly uh, from the Roosevelt era, particularly Eleanor, uh, actually, rather than Franklin, you know, Eleanor is actually largely responsible for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She's, that, that, that's Franklin's wife. Um, uh, uh, um, but even more particularly from the great society of the 1960s, America goes in a very, very different tra trajectory. How is Britain, England, because remember, Britain is simply Greater England. Um, I, I, I don't want to tread on too many toes by saying, oh, I do, I rather like, uh, it's one of my recreations in who's who. But if you actually look at Britain constitutionally, certainly before New Labour, it is simply Greater England. When Scotland and England unite um, in, uh, in, in, in the beginning of the 17th century, uh, in the beginning of the 18th century rather, when they reunite their parliaments, the only thing that they, as it were, that Scotland gives up is its political, separate political identity. And Scotland simply becomes part of the English parliamentary system. Wales had been part of the English parliamentary system since the reign of Henry VIII. Ireland is incorporated in 1801. 
So there was, and that, the, the, which is why people go on about Westminster. The Westminster system of politics stretched, which is Greater England. In the same way, we number our monarchs. It's the English succession of monarchs going back to the conquest. So what is the change specifically in England that has empowered a minority movement and handed it the degree of censorship and control which it actually enjoys? Now, I think that the answer to this is comparatively recent. There are earlier figures, uh, and when I push this argument uh, with, with other similar societies. And I talked about it, for example, at UCL. Um, there was a member of staff present who was a legal historian, and he immediately added to my list of guilty parties Keith Joseph um, and the destruction of English local government in the 1970s. Um, the, again, the Thatcher years have a very, very ambiguous uh, role in all of this. But the essential change, and it's a change which I think we need to understand the magnitude of, the changes introduced into the Constitution under New Labour are the single greatest change in our politics since 1689, since the glorious revolution of 1689. And we do need to register this. Now, when I mention the word Constitution, I can sort of see eyes glazing. We need to unglaze them. When you refer to a constitution of a person, you're referring to the funda their fundamental bodily health and structure. The constitution of a state plays exactly the same role in the operation of the body politic. And what I want to argue to you is that between 1997 and 2010, there was a deliberate self-conscious perversion of the existing Anglo-British Anglo model of government, and that we are reaping the catastrophic consequences of that. To summarise more quickly, what you do in, from, 19, from, from 1997 to 2010, you effectively render the constitution dysfunctional, because you incorporate absolutely contradictory elements within it. And those contradictory elements are the seedbed for the power of woke. That's the general, that's the big, the overall argument. Remember, when you're doing an essay, this is what you do. You set out the big picture, you frame it, you do not, you do not say what you're going to say. You introduce it. I can tell you as an examiner, the most boring thing in the world is the classic um, essay structure. It's say what you're going to say, say it and then repeat in the conclusion. You, you leave your examiner with tears of boredom staining his face and, and the pen firmly, in the old days before there was great inflation, firmly hovering over two to a third. But anyway, uh, I, 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 I divert. What is this thing that I call the classic English constitution? What is it? Where does it begin? Has anybody here ever read Hayek? Does anybody know who Hayek is? We, 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 well, now you see, it's really interesting you say he's an economist. He's the greatest of the Austrian school economists. He's the great opponent of, of Keynes, uh, um, Keynes, the essentially proponent of inflation as the basic drive. The, 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 the inflation, as it were, the measure of a functioning and growing economy. It is Hayek who points out the catastrophe of inflation. It's also Hayek who points out the fundamentally close relationship between welfareism and inflation. It's not for nothing that the, 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 the uh, Keynesian methods of economic management uh, arise immediately after 1945 with the creation of the, of the large-scale welfare state. But Hayek is also, I think, probably the greatest political philosopher of the 20th century. And he writes a book which I would strongly recommend you all to... It's, it's, he's a very good writer. It's very clear, very, very well set out. Um, uh, although he's, he's a German, right? he's an Austrian writing in English. It's nevertheless astonishingly clear. It's called The Constitution of Liberty. Any of you here who's a Tory, you may remember there's the famous story, uh, which, may I borrow your pad, um, in which in central office, and I can't remember which election campaign it is, Thatcher goes 
and slams down the Constitution of Liberty on the table in the central office and says, that's what we believe. But, ladies and gentlemen, there is a paradox. The last chapter of Hayek's book is why I am not a conservative. Um, whether, chap whether Margaret ever got to the last chapter, uh, you know, like many of us, you know, she never know about begins books with good intentions, but never gets quite to the end. Uh, but the, 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 that raises a very interesting question. If we talk about the ground of the English Constitution, if we talk about what I would argue is its essential conservatism, where do we begin? What are its elements? Now, if you look at anybody here doing politics, right, anybody here doing politics, tell me when and why does conservatism begin? Um, I guess in its kind of organised form with Robert Peel and the. Yeah, uh, in its disorganised form, it's in when does it begin intellectually? I mean, I don't think conservatism ever began at the moment, but intellectuals would tell you it began with uh, Edward Burke's. Yeah, revolution. and why, why does, why does Burke right. write what he did? Because he's opposed to the French Revolution. Yeah, it's, in other words, the classic, exactly, is called Reflections on the French Revolution, um, and it is this extraordinary denunciation of the French Revolution, remember, written when it's only been going 18 months. And he recognises everything that's going to happen. He predicts the terror, he predicts a military ruler, he predicts you know, vast war, all of it. It's quite astonishing. But it presents itself as a, as a thing which is essentially reactive and relatively late in time. Okay? So, because in, in that case, we're saying effectively 1789. It's also worth looking at what was Burke, what was Edmund Burke politically? Which party did he belong to? He was a Whig. An old Whig. He was a, a great, you know the distinction. Mm -hmm. Right. What's a new Whig? Um, new Whigs were, oh gosh, please tell me, put me out of my misery. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. It's like, I, there's no, there is no shame in admitting ignorance. The thing that's dreadful is to pretend to knowledge. So no shame. Anybody? Tell me what a new Whig is. What's the difference between old and new Whigs? When does it come in? Yes, it's the big, I think it's the big, it begins with the Reform Acts, but also with the shift of, if you like, English liberalism towards something more continental, towards something more socially based. So by the time that you're in the late 19th century, um, liberalism has acquired many of the trappings which lead naturally into the Labour Party. That's, that's, that's the great shift. Now, let's go back and then look at who the old Whigs were, right? And where I think we begin this process, not with Burke, not reactively, but substantially. Anybody here a medievalist? Anybody here or doing my period of history? Great. Okay, does the name Sir John Fortescue mean anything to you? Um, not really. Do, have you done 15th century England? Not yet, okay. Fortescue is the key theoretician of 15th century England. He writes a book, and I'm not sure whether this is a recommendation or not, whose title was stolen by Harold Wilson for his memoirs, um, The Governance of England. Um, and Fortescue, Fortescue's version of it is very extraordinary. It's written um, in, the, uh, in, in the 1470s, um, when uh, 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 40, sorry, 1460s, when he is in exile, he's a leading Lancastrian. Um, he becomes the chancellor in exile uh, to the Lancastrian Prince of Wales and to Margaret of Anjou when they're exiled in France. He is Lord Chief Justice in England and a great lawyer. And his experience in France leads him to do something very remarkable, which is to contrast how England is governed with how France is governed. And he comes up with, it's, he puts it in Latin, though the whole thing is written in, although it's early English, it's very, very clear English. He says England is, he calls it, a dominium politicum et regale, a royal and political dominion, whereas France is simply a dominium regale, it's simply a royal dominion. 
And effectively, what that means is, he says, and it's fascinating he homes in on this, he homes in on property and taxation. Because it seems to me one of the things that we've forgotten, if you look at the great triad of liberties uh, that Locke talks about, life, liberty, and property. property. We have forgotten it. The Conservative Party has forgotten it catastrophically. Property, it seems to me, is absolutely central to freedom, and that's not just me saying this, it's Aristotle. Um, the free man has needs, and indeed the only reason I survived the process of cancellation is because I have independent means. It's a very, very, it's a, it, it, an interesting direct contemporary, uh, uh, as it were, contemporary illustration of the point. Anyway, um, what, what he, he focuses on property. He says in France, the king, as far as the common people are concerned, can tax at will. He can take their property without consent. In England, because of the existing of existence of Parliament, the king can only tax with consent, freely given in Parliament. And he then goes on and does something completely extraordinary. He uses the words from the Bible, um, the, uh, by their fruits ye shall know them. Jesus is, Jesus is terribly good at politics. I'm not sure about religion, but he's very, you know, unto them which have, uh, from, uh, what, what is it, from, the, from those that have nothing, even that which they have shall be taken away. Seems to me to be a pretty accurate representation of late capitalism, but there we are. Uh, the, uh, but but, but, but he, he uses that wonderful phrase, by their fruits ye shall know them. And he gives a socioeconomic analysis. He says, France, the common people are poor. They exist off roots. Um, they are subject to an absolute law which is based on torture. Roman law is based on torture. England, people enjoy the fruits of their property. There is a high level of, of distributed wealth and people are free from the terror of, of torture. Okay, you're subject to horrible penalties if you're found guilty, but you don't use torture to establish, uh, to establish guilt. In other words, what he's saying is it's really important we understand this. England is a society based on a notion of freedom. France is a society which is not based on a notion of freedom. And it seems to me, it's also saying something else. He's saying England is a society which is based on absolute property right. France is a society not based on absolute England is a society which enjoys the rule of law, because you can, you can in England, you can only take. I mean, what is staggering? We were talking about Henry VIII when we were chatting before. You know, when Henry VIII confiscates the monasteries, everybody's interest, apart from the monks, is protected. Every single lease, every single contract they had entered into, is respected in law. Um, it is quite extraordinary. So there is this entrenchment of property, right? And there is the entrenchment of law. And finally, government is limited. Government cannot do what it wants, whereas France rejoices in being an absolute monarchy. Now, it seems to me that with uh, this is a contemporary analysis. And it seems to me, with all the comings and goings of historians, they've never actually bettered that contemporary analysis. Now, this has enormous consequences. It's what I would regard as the bedrock of England. And if it does any, I, again, only one of you has heard of Hayek. If you actually look at the socioeconomic conditions, which are normally regarded as being essential uh, for the development of capitalism, what are they? List them. Sorry. Unrestricted trade. Well, unrest yeah, freedom of trade. What else? Much more important. Secure property right. I mean, how else? How else? I mean, how else? What else? Contract. Rule of law. In other words, what are we really saying is that England, as early as the 15th century, had the basis of a capitalist society. 
In other words, there is absolutely no accident that the Industrial Revolution on a large scale first happens here. And it is because of the political constitution. Now, this again raises all sorts of interesting questions of the relationship of this to social patterns, like family structure. One of the things that's very striking about England is it's got weak family structure back in the Middle Ages. Um, this notion that everybody lived in extended families is not true. The work of the Cambridge Population Group demonstrates this absolutely convincingly. Compared with Ireland, compared with southern Italy, compared with Russia, English, English family structure was very weak, which means it's essentially individualistic. There's an extraordinarily impressive book, which I think should be much better known, by a man called Alan MacFarlane, called The Origins of English Individualism. Again, performing exactly the exercise that I've been doing now. So what I would argue is that this is the basic texture of the English Constitution. So what is the Civil War about, the 17th century Civil War? Who is the radical? Who is trying to change things at the beginning of the 17th century, if my reading is right? No. 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 Who is Charles is the king. I mean, we've got we get it completely wrong. The parliamentarians are the conservatives. They are trying to keep things going. But because remember, again, we've got to be we've I've been presenting a rather idealistic picture. Parliaments are a terrible nuisance. They get in the way of things. Uh, you know, again, look at what China does. Look at what Singapore does. Um, uh, Parliament is a boring, old-fashioned thing. Why not just what property rights? Dreadful. Why don't we just drive a high-speed rail line through your backyard? You know, why? Why do we have to? Do you see what I mean? Why do you have to negotiate? Are you following me? Why? Why they do? Why it's so much easier to build a high-speed line in France than it is in England, because you still have the inheritance of the absolute state. Whereas we still fight over the last... You know, look at neighbour disputes in England. The, these disputes over half an inch of land between two fences, uh, tearing families and villages apart. Anyway, so the Conservatives uh, in the... Uh, the Conservatives, in, uh, to begin with at least, uh, in the Civil War are... Uh, are Charles, uh, sorry, are, 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 the, are the parliamentarians, particularly people like Edward Cook, um, and the king and his ministers like, uh, like um, uh, Thomas Wentworth, the Earl of Strafford, uh, and Archbishop Lord, they are the radicals. I mean, they've even got the name through. Let's get, a, you know, let's get ahead with it. Let's, let's not have all these silly, funny, duddy rules. But of course, what happens when you actually uh, defeat the king, when you execute the king, is that the entire polity topples over. And Cromwell, the problem with Cromwell is that he can never establish legitimacy. It's the issue which really has suffered. I mean, why has France had five, const whatever it is, how many constitutions has France had since the revolution? Quickly. No, which republic are we in? Oh, right, five republics, what else? Two empires and two monarchies. It's had nine constitutions in just over 200 years. Uh, that's the degree of instability. That's the degree uh, of, of problems that come when you cut a king's head off. What did we do? Well, we sort of stitched it back on. Uh, we had, literally, by the way, Charles is buried at Windsor with his head stitched back on. Um, uh, uh, we, we reversed the revolution. And it's really very extraordinary. This is the only time that a revolution is reversed without foreign intervention. The English decide to do it themselves. This is a very, very, very extraordinary story. Why? Why do you bring a king back? But it seems to me that a Lord Protector, the problem with a Lord Protector, especially with a powerful army, is that he is an absolute monarch. He has absolute power. You are incapable of producing a parliamentary assembly that can control him. Whereas a king, with all the flummery of kingship, is a limited known power. And by the way, any of you who are studying this period, you might be interested no, Oliver Cromwell is buried with the imperial crown, a purple robe, an orb and a scepter in the most magnificent uh, funeral that any English ruler has ever had. 
In other words, the only choice in the only choice in 1660 was whether you had a, a king who was called Cromwell or whether you had a king who was called Stuart. That was the only choice. But you bring back the old balanced structure. And in 1689, you counter again a king who was wanting to drive, James II, who was wanting to drive through um, a, a policy of radical royal intervention. And, and you bring back this balanced, limited, restrictive constitution, which, of course, opens the way. I mean, what is quite extraordinary, once you've solved the problems and the tensions of, of the constitution uh, of, of uh, the 17th century, as I'm sure we're all aware, we're all aware. We you know, we tend to think of England's great epoch, Britain's great epoch, as being the 19th century. It's not. It's the 18th. This staggering shift of again, it's indecent, isn't it? Uh, generally speaking, seen as indecent to talk about nations in terms of power. 1689, 1688, England is really a French dependency. 1705, there's the Battle of Blenheim and you shatter the power of Louis XIV, and it never recovers. It's, it's, it's staggering in that tiny, tiny period of time. So what I'm trying to establish is that there is a genuine conservative tradition in England, which is old Whig tradition. It's based on the idea of freedom, and it is vindicated repeatedly by revolution and counter-revolution in the 17th century. And what that tradition shows itself as being uniquely is not simply the, the, the thing from which the extraordinary economic uh, imperial growth of the 18th and 19th century springs. It's much more than that. I think it is the wellspring of actual freedom. Uh, the, the, everybody goes on about the Enlightenment as though it's a French phenomenon. It's not. France is just a series of bad translations. All bad ideas are French. It's an absolute, abs and this is, I'll explain the reason for that afterwards. But, but the Enlightenment is Anglo-Scottish. It starts in the late 17th century with, with, with Newton and Locke, and then it goes up to Scotland um, with, with, with great, great figures uh, like Adam Smith and, and David Hume uh, and, and all of that lot. Um, uh, and the French are just, the, what the French do is systematise it um, crudely and turn it turn this wonderful organic thing into something mechanical right so the it, it triggers the enlightenment this extraordinary flowering of human creativity and remember by the 18th century by the end of the 18th century in england it's the first time post roman civilization catches up with rome do we understand when we talk about the decline of civilization and there are very good reasons for doing it the catastrophe that the fall of rome is it takes, it takes you nearly 2,000, whatever it is, 1,800 years to recover from that. And it's, it's an extraordinary story. Right, so that constitution is not only capable of doing all those things, of, of empowering economic growth, intellectual growth, of, 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 uh, of, of imperial growth and so on, and it, 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 it is able to accommodate. If you look at all other Europeans, virtually every other European state in the 18th and 19th centuries, they have to undergo revolution in order to accommodate the new social forces of industrialization and women and all the rest of it. Where we have um, uh, the women's officer here, as she repeatedly told me, um, uh, with, with, a, with a, wonderfully, a wonderfully smoothing task. That was not how the, uh, the suffragettes won, if we remember. Uh, but uh, but the, 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 what is remarkable about 18th, um, uh, the England of the, eight, of the 19th and the early 20th century is that all the agitation, all the movements of agitation, the Chartists, the trade unionists, the, the suffragettes, they're not competing to bring the constitution down. They are competing to take part in it. They want to enter into Parliament, which Parliament is seen as the genuine, exactly as Fortescue had seen it, as the genuine representative body, which binds everybody, because everybody is there represented. And that, remember, it's astonishing. That's the word, that description of Parliament is the product of judges of the 13th and 14th century. You know, it's still the theory, 
that underpins parliamentary so Dicean parliamentary sovereignty today. Now, what it, what, why do I say that what happened under New Labour is in catastrophic conflict with this? But it seems to me that it is in catastrophic conflict. Well, this goes back again to what we, why does Burke object as violently as he did to the French Revolution? Well, first of all, he sees that it's going to be a catastrophe. But what enables him? Has anybody read the reflections at all? Right. These are not easy, are they? The vast swathes of which are tedious as bloody hell when he's going on about Assigny uh, and, and French... Am, am I not right? And French local government boundaries. And then there are passages which are pure political poetry. Absolutely astonishing insight and what, whatever. Why, does, why is Burke able to predict that, to put it as a coarsely, France will fuck up. Why? Because again, remember, he is a high, in Burke's a high intellectual, and he is, he begins this with an analysis of an idea, right? He says that all states have a contract to primordial society and to abrogate therefrom, um, it, it's like, Freedom becomes a dangerous, poisonous gas. You're getting very close. Very good. Um, what, is, what is the famous phrase in Burke in which he expresses that idea of the primordial contract? That if there is a contract, it is a contract between um. the living, oh. the dead, and, and those yet to be born. Mm. It's a contract across time. And what he's arguing, in other words, is that a state is not a product of the reasoning of a single generation or of a single mind. It's like a free market economy. This is the brilliant way in which Hayek analyzes it. He uses his same understanding of the idea of the free... In other words, what Adam Smith is talking about. Or, if you can't be bothered to read Adam Smith, because he's Scottish and very sanctimonious, um, there's, 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 the, there's, the, there's the wonderful uh, the, the, uh, Mandeville's Fable of the Bees, which is a marvellous satire, which is looking at two states, one of which is run on solid, republican, uh, kind of Gordon Brown principles, in which everybody is virtuous and does the right thing, and the other is run on the kind of lines that I rather approve of, in which people get drunk and there's lots of extravagance and you, be, you wear wonderful silks and satins and have great buildings. Which is the rich society? The one where people misbehave. Remember, all, all, all capitalism caters essentially to human vanity. Do you actually need an iPhone? Do I need a suit like this? Do you need that great lump? I mean, do you real? How much of the word process, of the actual processing power of that computer, do you actually use? Mm -hmm. A thousandth. Yeah. It's in other words that that capitalism is product of luxury. What we now know is, in fact, that the industrial revolution doesn't begin as we always used to think with iron and steel. What does it begin with? Tea, China. Nice fabrics, cotton. It, begi it begins with the apparatus of everyday life. There's um, my uh, uh, my former student. Um, oh God knows what's he called. Uh, very bright lad, German. Um, gone completely out of my head. But he he's he wrote a remarkable book um, on um, uh, on the industrial uh, on on um, capitalism as a product of the luxury trades. It's exactly what it is. Right, so Burke, then, is looking at the idea of a constitution like an economy that is a kind of natural growth. What do the French try to do? What is he getting cross about? Um, no, he's lost interest. Right, OK, your president's lost interest. I was trying to wake him up, um, but never mind. <laughs> what, 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 why does Burke attack the French? No, no, yeah. They behead their king, they confiscate uh, wealth from the church. Yeah, but what, on what principle do they do it? Uh, 
What do the French begin? What does the French? What does the French Assembly begin doing? Redesigning a new state. It redesigns everything. With no precedent. It it redesigns everything. Um, what, 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 what the first thing they do is, of course, introduce this silly business of 10. Now, we, can, we, we, think, we think that metrication is sort of rational. What's it based on? A false measurement of the diameter of the Earth. It's supposed, you know, it's supposed to be natural. Um, uh, by the way, but they also tried to introduce a calendar based on 10 and a clock based on 10. You try doing that. Um, what else do they do? They try and make every single... Um, uh, uh, area of government in France the same. So you wipe away the entire natural inheritance of, of communities in favour of these artificial things called département. What else do you do? You sweep away the entire existing structure of law and introduce a legal code. So in other words, what the French do is have a rationalistic view. Um, and again, it's really important, when I made the joke about um, all bad ideas being French, it is because there are two radically, the, on, on either side of the channel, and some of you are, you know, some of you are I suspect, um, originally non-English speaking, and it's it very interesting for you to think of this, because you're operating in different languages. English is the most inductive of languages. You build up. So how do you write an address in English? You begin with the most specific, flat eight. That's my address in Tavistock Chambers. In German, what do you do? Street first, number second, which is obviously the logical way of doing it, but not the way we do it. The French carry this to absolute extreme. And they've, in fact, it's really interesting. If I was talking about the period of the late 17th century as this moment of absolute transformation in England. Uh, and the key figure in it is, of course, Isaac Newton. The equivalent figure in France is Descartes. And Descartes operates on a principle of absolutely universal reason. In other words, what he thinks is right and what he thinks is wrong. And deduce, tries to deduce everything from general principles. How does a scientist work? How does science work? inductively. It works from the particular to the general. And in other words, our two cultures operate in wildly different fashions. And if you like, what I would argue is that the French method of abstract reason and concocting general theories, you know, just, just snatched out of the air, is an utterly disastrous way of analysing society and conducting government. So what happens, it seems to me, uh, in, in the period, uh, what happens in the actual period uh, of, um, the, uh, of New Labour is that effectively you introduce into the antique, inductive, unwritten English constitution, you introduce a whole series of things that derive from these new rationalist, pseudo-reasonable principles that have been peddled in France. And the result is a series of absolute contradictions. I mean, anybody here a lawyer? Anybody here studying law? Great, good. Explain to me how on earth you can have, in a state which believes in Dicean parliamentary sovereignty, how can you have a Supreme Court? Uh, it would probably go to the idea of constitutional statutes, so it you know, but, but I mean, think about it. There's, it's an absolute contradiction. Um, if you look in America, there's an obvious role for a Supreme Court, because in America, you do not have a notion of a single sovereign. The Constitution is sovereign. So you need an arbiter of the Constitution. Um, whereas we have had, right through from the very beginning of the idea of Parliament, Parliament is sovereign. Because everybody, I mean, the king sits in parliament, the lords sit in parliament, the bishops sit in parliament, the, uh, the MPs from the county sit in parliament, the MPs from, from the, um, what's it called, sit in parliament. Um, uh, so the, 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 there is a, a direct contradiction. Let me, put, let me put another idea to you. If you believe in the sovereignty of parliament, how can you have a doctrine of universal human rights? Yeah, you shouldn't be able to. 
more modern law trying to transform itself. Yeah, and it's catastrophic. Yeah. Because it means, of course, that you know, the, where, 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 from where, whence do, does the notion of universal human rights? Well, who's the legislator? Where's the consent? Well, Tony Blair. Well, no, but yeah, yeah, Tony Blair. Yeah, gee, gee, Tony Blair is bloody gob. Um, uh, but but you see what you see the points I'm trying to get at. There is an absolute contradiction. Again, you tried to introduce the idea of separation of powers with removing uh, the Lord Chancellor, who was the leading law officer of government. In other words, dealing with the so-called separation of powers of, of, of justice. Um, he was a senior judge, but he sat in the cabinet. Uh, and he also chaired the House of Lords. You say, this is absolutely outrageous. So you demote the position and you try to abolish the tradition of Lord, position of Lord Chancellor, except that Charlie Faulkner, uh, Blair's little left-hand man, uh, left man, was so hopeless uh, that he didn't realise that the Lord Chancellor appears in about 5,000 statutes. You know, that you cannot abolish it. Uh, and it but, in, but, but the attempt at in abolishing it, I'm sure, is why we have the terrible chaos of criminal justice, which we do now. Uh, if you'd had the prestige of the office of Lord Chancellor, like Mackay of Clashfern of the Tories, uh, uh, or, or uh, whatever he was called, Derry Irving under Labour, that would never have happened. Um, and the, I remember, the idea of a separation of powers in England is deranged. Why is it deranged? What is, wh where does our government sit? In the legislature. The government controls the legislature. Do you see what I mean? So what New Labour did was to introduce a series of absolutely wild and unresolved constitutional contradictions, which is why we've had repeated constitutional crises. We're having, just one second, we're having a, uh, come, I'm not trying to suppress, which is why we're having the one over immigration at the moment and the relationship of parliamentary statute to notions of international law. Sorry. So we do not agree that it's not all... Sorry, can, can you say that again? I said we do not agree that it's not all necessarily, contra necessarily contradictory because one of the Labour reforms was to split the highest court of appeal from being the House of Lords, which sat within the legislature, being a Supreme Court that was separate. But what I tried to say is the idea of a Supreme Court is nonsensical in England. I mean, again, the absurdity of a law court daring to rule on the matter of parliamentary prerogation. If that is a direct contradiction of the Bill of Rights. Um, I mean, we've landed ourselves in the most... Right, so that's a general picture. Why does it matter to us, and we can now stop and we can you know, throw this thing open? Because this structure, this new structure that I've described, is the hot bed of woke. It's this new structure... Not the old, not the parliamentary structure, not the, not the representative structure, which has been... Pe it's the un all of this structure, just one second, all of this structure limits the power of parliament and limits the power of the electorate. And we've left out one other absolutely crucial thing, which is the fact that nearly all direct government action has now been franchised out to quangos. Parliament actually decides virtually nothing. Financial policy is largely the domain of the, of the Bank of England Monetary, uh, Monetary Policy Committee. Budget, the, the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, second, third and fourth guesses the Chancellor. The vast area of climate change has been run by the Climate Change Committee, which is run by a series of self-interested fanatics um, who themselves are... I mean, the thing is scandalous, <coughs> are profiteering gigantically out of all of uh, the, the, uh, the, the whole business of planning permission has, has been uh, you know, thrown into chaos by people like, by, by Tony Juniper's running of, of English nature, which sets a water bowl against a railway line. Um, um, uh, but this is the hotbed of woke. And it is, it, the whole tendency of new labour has been to shift power away from the people, away from popular rep representatives, towards managerialist, pseudo-professional, legal groups. And of course, we see just how well they handle that power in the post office scandal. I rest my case. I'm happy to debate it.
Well, thank you very much. We have a quick round of applause. Right, so I'll ask a couple of questions now, and then uh, after that, I'll go over to you, uh, uh, you the audience, to uh, hear what you have to say. Uh, right, so uh, first things first, um, you know, you're talking about New Labour and uh, what you believe to have the disastrous effects of it. Do you think these uh, changes are inevitable, or, or are they here to stay? I, I mean, the, 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 the thing that is, that is great is that a Conservative government didn't realise it needed to reverse them. If you actually look at the last 15 years of doing nothing, uh, it is because you do not tackle these things. You, until you reverse, until we have another restoration, until we reverse these changes, it is impossible to govern England and Britain in the fashion which it used to be governed. And this is why there is such popular discontent with politics. There's a reason for it. It's not simply that we've got fourth-rate politicians. Yes, we do have fourth-rate politicians. We've been talking about quite a few of them. Uh, we all know them. Uh, they are fourth-rate, but that's not the key issue. It's not that they're mildly corrupt. Compared with, say, a Lloyd George, they're barely corrupt at all. Lloyd George just happened to be a genius. Um, uh, it's, it, it, something has gone. What I'm trying to do, I'm trying to show there's a deep structural reason that all these things have happened. It's not accident. And the first thing that a Conservative government should have done was to start reversing them. Look, right late in the day now, with immigration and the small boats crisis, they're effectively saying we need to remove the... the we, we, we need to, as it were, uncouple ourselves from the European Convention on Human Rights. Absolutely spot on. Uh, but, of course, they've left it too late. They're also not presenting a general argument. They're letting it be caught up simply in the business of being, oh, shouldn't we be kind to poor little immigrants, you know? Um, but there's been this absolute failure to grasp the fundamental issues. I mean, think, think again how long it took Thatcher, think how long it took the Conservative Party um, to waken up to what really had happened from 1945. It takes 30 years. The <coughs> and again... Hayek is fascinating on this. He points out that, that what we call conservatism is really Toryism. It's really, it's really uh, the, the, the leftovers of the aristocratic party of the 19th century, which was filled in its best side. It was filled with notions of noblesse oblige. And there was the basic sense of, there was a thing called the establishment, which begins, of course, as the established church. And what you then try to do, and people like Baldwin are key, key examples of this, in the 20th century, you try to incorporate the new elements of labour into that establishment. So, for example, do we all know the origins of the modern honours system? Uh, the thing that there's been, you know, we've talked about Paula Venels. Um, 1917. Does anybody know what happened in 1917? You completely reinvent the monarchy. You um, change the name of the royal house. You turn it from a German dynasty into an English family. But most interestingly of all, you completely reinvent the honour system. And you create the thing that I've got by the skin of my teeth, uh, the CBE, uh, you, uh, 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 the, the orders of the British Empire. You create it as a mass order of chivalry to cater to mass armies and mass bureaucracy and uh, mass voluntary org organisations. Where does the, this is under George V, where does the first inauguration of the Order of the British Empire take place? I can tell you where inaugurations take place now. Uh, uh, sorry, installations, um, uh, inauguration is the wrong word, investitures. Where I can tell you where they take place now. They take place in the uh, rather ritzy, gilded splendours of the ballroom and Buckingham Palace. Right. Where does the first in 1917 take place. Height of the First World War. Ibrox Park Football Stadium. <laughs> Can you imagine that? We think we have a sort of modernising monarchy. Can you imagine that? King in khaki, the star of the show is not, you know, the, the people got GCVs and visit, or the star of the show is a little girl, uh, a, a little woman, 
of 18-year-old who worked in a munitions factory in Glasgow, and she's given the lowest decoration of the war. She's given an MBE because she's an incredibly good worker. You know, you're churning out musicians to fight the Germans. And uh, again, you, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the women's officer will forgive me if I do this. And uh, you will remember that Edwardian ladies' dress involves this very tight belt and everything sticking out. And she had notable sticking out bits. And the king was not with the queen. And it was astonishing the length of time that he took to pin the MBE to her left breast. As this vast cheer from the throng goes up, they bring in a VC dying on a stretcher. You know, th this, and the most interesting thing of the lot, they create a new order called the Companions of Honour, and do you know the companion? Now it's a kind of also ran for the Order of Merit. Do you know what it was created for? Trade unionists and members of the Labour Party, whose morals would prevent them from accepting other honours because they carried titles of dignity. And of course, as good socialists, they couldn't possibly. <laughs> and so the first members of the, of the Order uh, of Companions of Honour were trade unionists and socialists. And the, the, the Ibox Park investiture is greeted by one of the newspapers saying, we are all socialists now. So what the, what the government's doing, what the monarchy is doing, what Baldwin is doing, you're incorporating labour and the trade unions into the establishment, which is what Thatcher reacts against. Do we all realise this? By the time you've got to the Second World War, the General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress was effectively treated as a peer, he always sat as a member, as a governor of the BBC. Uh, um, he is, you know, he, he occupies the kind of guru position. And this is true of body, body art, again, the, 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 the key figures um, in, in the great Labour government uh, of, of, uh, of 45. They're people, they're people like, uh, like Ernie Bevan. And who, what was Ernie Bevan? What was the source of his power? He was the general secretary of the, of the Transport and General Workers Union. And the headquarters of the Labour Party is actually called Transport House. So you see what I mean? It's this doctrine of incorporating, of incorporating the left into the establishment. And, and Hayek bitterly attacks this. He sees this as the compromise, the thing that's un, uh, the, 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 that has prevented conservatism from doing what it should, which is reacting against the welfare state, against um, or, or the kind of absurd structure of welfareism that was introduced in, in 1945. Remember, Beveridge wanted a completely different kind of welfare state. What did Beveridge want? He, what, how, did, how, did he want to, how did he want it to be based? On contribution. He wanted, he taught you, that's why you have this, this, this non-thing called national insurance. The idea was, but of course, New Labour wanted a quick, sorry, the old Labour wanted a quick fix. So you just bring the thing in out of general taxation with, with, with catastrophic consequences. Churchill knew he should have done something about it. Not in, not, not, not in 49, not in 51 when he wins. Too frightened. Mm -hmm. and, it's, it's, and again, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the figures of the Tory, you know, the real villains are, are the trinity of, 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 uh, uh, of David Cameron, uh, George Osborne, and Michael Gove. Uh, they worshipped at the altar of New Labour. And the, uh, Michael Gove, in particular, hands round the copy of Blair's memoirs as the new Machiavelli. Uh, Cameron describes himself as the heir to Blair. Absolutely unthinking about the consequences. Right, thank you very much for that. Um, so you talked um, about the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, is can uh, revolutions... Uh, ever bring uh, true freedom? The evidence is overwhelming that they don't. I mean, look at the... I mean, isn't the general evidence that what revolutions do is effectively replicate the structures of the previous state? I mean, isn't, isn't it quite clear, Z or whatever he's called, or Mao, a mad emperor? And they're emperors. They behave exactly like emperors. Um, the, in the same way, Stalin, and, and it's now become absolutely uh, evident with Putin, they're czars, particularly nasty and unpleasant czars. As I'm sure many, any of you, I mean, those of you who've done Russian history will know that most of the czarist secret police just swapped over. 
Um, and, and it is one of the one of the great problems is that we have this myth that revolution because people, especially young men, love the idea of revolution. You know, shirts off and waving flags and being heroic. Um, and it it is of course you can see it. I mean, the 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 the, the, the great paint the great nineteenth century romantic paintings of the French Revolution. You can see, and again the whole idea of radical change is profoundly appealing. Mm -hmm. it just happens to be wrong. And, and I, I mean, all I would just say is the, ev the historical evidence is overwhelmingly on my side. Um, the, the thing that is overwhelmingly not on my side is that it may be possible with the kind of intellectual background, which is largely engineering, of the new Asian elites of Singapore and China, it may be possible that you can introduce a simulacrum of an advanced economy providing you spend all your time copying. The real test is going to be whether China can actually innovate. And the, uh, my general view is, that, which I made clear, that innovation depends on freedom. I mean, this is the essential reason why you lot exist or should exist. The freedom of speech is not just there to let steam off. It is because the ba it's the basis of all human advance. All human, it's, it's not, I don't, I don't mean that human advance simply just consists of being rude or rejecting or whatever, but debate is fundamental. The willing, the, in other words, the, the fact that one in principle should regard nothing as being sacred. That doesn't mean that you tear everything down, but you have to be prepared to discuss, debate. Um, but it's also, and again, this is what's so wonderful about Hayek, about, about Adam Smith, about, uh, 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 about David Hume, this idea of an order which arises spontaneously. Remember, it's very, very similar, isn't it, to the theory of evolution. Small random changes leading in a particular direction. And um, again, Hayek is brilliant on the, the fact that nearly all uh, of Charles Darwin's ideas are to be found in people like Adam Smith, Burke, and whatever, this, 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 uh, and more, more particularly David Hume. Right, thank you very much. Um, so now I'm going to uh, allow uh, any of you to ask uh, questions. Gosh, that's not very free, is it? I, his Majesty is going to allow him. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, yes, Elliot. Um, the great quote from Burke, quoted by reformers, is a state without the means of change is without the means of its own conservation. What does change with reference to precedent look like? Well, again, somebody else who is very good on this is, sorry, this is very paint on the bum. Uh, the, one, of the th one of the people who's brilliant on this is the late Disraeli. And Disraeli, in his great speech, he, he does two versions of the speech. One is at Crystal Palace, and the other is very appropriately in the Free Trade Hall in Manchester. And he, again, offers a radically different view of conservatism. He says, conservatism in a progressive society, which he take the, they take for granted, Victorian England is a progressive society, is about change. The issue is not do we change, listen carefully, but how we change. Do you change in accordance with abstract universalist liberal principles, or do you change in accordance with the traditions of your own country? And what you, I mean, Again, what one has to understand is, after all, Britain, England, with this inductive, apparently chaotic society, pioneers modernity. Do we all understand this? Again, this is not idle boasting. Britain is actually where modernity starts. It's the late 17th century is where it happens. Um, and um, in other words, the, the, and it happens for the, all the reasons that I've been trying to explain. The... The, the opposite, the, the idea of effectively treating, treating human beings, I mean, the, the, the great problem with the French approach, uh, or the, the, the high German approach, is effectively that the legislator or the ruler 
treats human beings as colours on an artist's palette. I mean, it's no accident. Well, I'm, I'm now going to be shocked because, of course, Churchill's a painter too, uh, and a better one than Hitler. But, but this, 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 he's actually rather good. Uh, uh, the, 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 Hitler's, Hitler has this view that you sort of simply, all of them, you remodel the world in accordance with whatever uh, principle you, you pull down. And that's catastrophic. And the, again, the, she, the, the, the really important thing, and again, New Labour was, of course, with this childish neophilia, new worship. Remember, things that have lasted a long time have lasted a long time for good reason. It's not, it's, you know, it's not mindless conservatism. It, you know, the rule of is it ain't broke, don't fix it is a very, very good one. And at the moment, I mean, the, again, the evidence seems to me to be absolutely clear. It is clear that our existing mess of the state structure is functioning profoundly badly. It's devastatingly broke. The issue is, how do we go about repairing it? Do we exercise this, you know, this, this, this abstract rationality of the French model of liberalism? Or do we effectively say that we were staggeringly well governed? for several hundred years, that the principles are known, and that essentially what you need to do is a restoration, not a revolution. That's, that's the, in a nutshell, that's what I'm suggesting. Okay, so um, you argue very succinctly against new constitutional principles that have been adopted since New Labour, right? So independent judiciary, no, no, we have an independent judiciary. Well, an independent Supreme Court, which is able to provide... Well, no, 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 the House of Lords was completely independent. But the, the question... House of Lords is a part of Parliament. Oh, yeah, but what, what difference did that make? How do you mean? If it's part no, of... No, 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 sorry, but what... what the, 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 well, you didn't the, let me pose my question. Sorry? You didn't let me pose my question. Oh, well, then, what please going, do. What I was going to say was, how can you argue that parliamentary rights, parliamentary sovereignty is going to infringe when parliamentary sovereignty was used to introduce these new constitutional principles. You know, you, you talk about Tony Blair and New Labour as if they are some imposition upon the parliamentary superstructure when actually they were elected on the same principle that every government mm -hmm. before and since them has been elected. The changes that they introduced were not some imposition by some foreign power. They were, they were introduced on the basis of our existing system. So why is it so alien to you? Oh, the, 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 you, 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 uh, no, 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 no. you perfectly right. And they were introduced legally. Uh, they were introduced by a sovereign parliament. That doesn't mean that they're not mistaken. That what I'm trying to point out is that they, the elements were logically contradictory, which is why we've had repeated constitutional crises, which we haven't had. But but surely, well, uh, okay, so if we take the, the largest constitutional crisis of the world, No, that wasn't a constitutional crisis. Was it? Uh, it, the, the, the constitutional crisis was then a parliament which decided that it was going to try to imitate uh, the long parliament with the speaker imagined he would speak a lentil. The, 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 uh, the, that, was, that was a disaster. But I mean, what, I'm trying, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that the, the things that New Labour introduced, although they were introduced legally, I've never denied it, they were, they, of course they were introduced legally, but they were utterly misconceived. The, the general tendency of Labour was to try to make Britain look like a newly enfranchised ex-Soviet republic. And, well, you just, you, you reach down a constitution that, it, that is a sort of silly little textbook. We've got to have a separation of powers when there's never been any tradition of it Every in Britain. Every other country except, I think, Israel has a separation of powers. Why should Britain be any different? Uh, because because has these, has these principles which allow every other country to introduce things that are good, such as universal human rights, an independent judiciary that's a part of the legislature. Why can't we introduce? But sorry, this? why do you why is it so wrong? Why do you think sorry? Why why do you think universal human rights are such a wonderful thing? Every country in Europe is going to reverse them for that the simple is, reason well, for the simple reason it cannot so. it cannot con that? it cannot control immigration without. Haven't you noticed what the general drift of politics in the Europe is? The failure of the control of immigration is down to a legislative failure in European countries and as part of the European uh, 
sorry, can you explain? Uh, if you have, but so if a legislative, a legislative failure assumes that states have got the power against a universal, the, the two elements, aren't there? There is the, the declaration which actually governs refugee status, mm. and which, was con which was put together in the wildly different circumstances of the 1940s, and also the notion which we were discussing before, that, that uh, notions of international law somehow take, which is a fiction, take precedence uh, actually over uh, the sovereign legislators of nation states. Can I just ask if we don't too much back and forth? Okay. No, 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 it's a bit, but I have got, sorry, I don't need okay. defending. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't, and nor does he. Um, uh, and yeah, this is, a, no, 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 sorry, I, you don't. Um, it's, no, it's, it, it, it's perfect. we've not been discourteous to each other. No, um, uh, uh, on the contrary, this is exactly what it's about. The, the, point is, the point that I'm trying to make is it is quite clear that universal human rights are, have become a catastrophe. Are you familiar with the work of, of a man called, I, I can never remember if it's Jacob or Joseph Machangama? I'm not that. Right. It would be worth it if you're going to have that argument to familiarise himself. He wrote a very impressive book on freedom of speech. The more interesting thing is the article which he published about five years ago, in which he looked at where the origin of the idea of hate speech comes from. That de deliberate determination to limit freedom of speech. And he demonstrates wonderfully that it arises from the doctrine of universal human rights and the actual processes within the United Nations which uh, transform uh, the, uh, the declaration, the universal, this is not the European, this is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into the Convention. But don't vote the universal No, just, uh, please, please, you, are, you said you wanted to finish a point, let me finish one. And, and the, the way in which, the, 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 way in which the, the procedures of the Convention uh, are dominated we have the, the United Nations unwisely kept a complete record of the debates in committee. And all the moves to limit freedom of speech, which have been now used as the basis within human rights of hate speech, which is the thing we are you know, seeking to limit us all, all of them, who presented them in the debate, it was the Soviet Union and its satellites, using anti-imperialism and racism as the basis. And we've got to understand, again, you're prattling about universal human rights. Who is on the Universal Human Rights Committee of the United Nations? Look at them. It, it is Iran. It is Saudi Arabia. The derangement of the United Nations. The, it's, it's the fact that it's perfectly clear that the settlement that's based on all those principles that you endorsed of 45 is turning out to be as catastrophic as the League of Nations. I mean, look at the mess of international relations now. We've had enough. Um, we'll move. No, 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 no. We don't want to take up the whole thing. No, of course um, not. Um, but, and uh, you've set out your position, I've set out mine. Uh, two quick things I want to say, David. Uh, one where I'm going to agree with you, and one where I'm going to make Good. a tangent as well, although your historical knowledge is superior, so I know yourself on this one. Um, firstly, I wanted to back up what I thought you said about New Labour uh, and the argument about the changes to the constitution they made and why there was no historical precedent and why the British system did fail beforehand. I want to know when you look at what they do, whether it's evolution of moving to a more federal system, where, whether it's the Supreme Court and separation of powers, uh, or whether it's the entrenchment of the Code by Constitution, which is the right hand like we never saw before. Were they striving for an American system we never needed? They were, they were in fact, they were profound. This is, no, I made a separate point. They were much more influenced by Charter 88. They are much more influenced by this kind of all-purpose wallpaper constitution, which, as I said, a newly enfranchised Soviet Republic might adapt, might adapt for itself. Um, and again, remember, universal human rights are also based on an absurd idea that human beings are all the same. We're not. The thing that shows the absolute validity of my argument is Blair's foreign policy. His interventions in Iraq and whatever were entirely founded on the basic notion that all human beings are the same. Therefore, we assumed when we went into Iraq that we would be greeted with open arms as liberators. What fools we were. Human societies are historic creations. They're not creations of the fantasy of Eleanor Roosevelt or Tony Blair. And this is the problem uh, with, with, again, French naive, the, French, the whole French, tradition of French naivete. 
And, but that, that, I th that I think is the, as I said, it, it, they could well have been looking to America. Except, you see, America is a very interesting story. Uh, America really isn't a revolution. It's a revolt. And if you actually look at the American Constitution, and don't, if you don't believe me, uh, don't look at Tom Paine. Tom Paine says this very clearly. The American Constitution is merely George Washington wearing George III's crown. The, the resemblance of the American Constitution to that of late 18th century England is staggering. Uh, who is the administrative officer of the House of Representatives? No American can pronounce it. He's the sergeant at arms. The simple reason he's the administrative officer of the English Parliament, uh, and, uh, of the English House of Commons. And in detail, and again, as I, if you look at the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights is not like the Declaration of Human Rights at all. The Bill of Rights, the American Bill of Rights, is essentially merely restating the universal rights of common law. The great problem with the with the, the adaptation that has happened to the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, of universal human rights, is that it has turned into group rights rather than universal rights. And this is the catastrophic. It, what it does is it entrenches the rights of groups against the mass, against, against the, the bulk of, uh, of the community. Uh, it does actually something worse. Um, it, 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 the, the original idea of human rights is, of course, and it was, why does it arise in 45? It's to protect the individual against the state. That's what it's there for. But if you turn it into the protection of minorities, the only group that can protect minorities against the majority is the state. So what we've done with the whole of hate speech and everything else is to stand human rights on their head and to turn them into instruments of social control when they're intended to be instruments of social liberty. Yeah, you had a second point. The other thing I wanted to ask, there were two things that you said about historical Toryism, which is something that I'm very interested in, but I didn't think completely stood together, and I wanted you to explain in a bit more detail. On the one hand... You may know about more about this. I'm not a 19th century historian. Yeah. Well, well, on the one hand, you, you talked about the fact that, you know, conservatism or Toryism, as you call it, I think you write about that, um, was very anti-morphization in the 19th century. Mm. You talked about how it was very mm. progressive. Mm. On the other hand, you invoked my political idol, Benjamin Disraeli, and you talked about how Disraeli stood for some level of change, but within the traditional background, I struggle to see how someone who enfranchised voters with the Reform Act in 1867 was the first Jewish Prime Minister, Prime Minister of our age, and fundamentally, the first Prime Minister ever to not go to Oxford or Cambridge, and fundamentally changed the way that politics was done through some of the legislation mm. passed. All of those things. Social housing, for example. Fits the model that you try to paint 19th century Toryism as, and I wonder if you well, I can do it very simply. Look at Disraeli when he's a young man. Look at Disraeli as a novelist. You will find that, like many of us, I speak with the experience of, of having lived even longer than Disraeli, um, <laughs> you, you change. And the young Disraeli is the proponent. Do you know what I mean when I talk about young England? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, he's the proponent of a revived chivalry, uh, of of uh, of of a revived aristocracy. Of uh, but again, with some ideas that very much he plays with, but in a very different, much more politically imaginative way. He always had the belief that somehow the aristocracy and the common people had a lot in common, whereas it's all these horrible uh, kind of money grubbers in the middle who are the characteristic liberal voters, who are the ones that you want to exclude. And, and in other words, uh, Disraeli actually manages to pull off the coalition, which, of course, Boris aimed to do but never quite did. That's what I would say. Um, uh, so, but I think, I think it is, again, Hayek is very interesting on the old and the young Disraeli. Do you, do you actually think... Uh, uh, and, uh, but again, sorry, uh, ju just, just, just again to, uh, uh, to uh, look at how Disraeli pulls it off, the, the, the great way in which Disraeli actually pulls it off are some of those little, well, obviously the broadening of the franchise, the famous, the famous Times editorial about, see, you know, like the sculptor with the, with, the, with the block of marble who sees the angel within. He saw, you know, the, the, the figure of the British working man was actually you know, not a figure of rebellion, but, but you know, a worthy participant in the body politic. But, but the real key to understanding Disraeli and how he pulls it off is imperialism. 
that, that the, the whole business of Victoria and the Empress of India, the extraordinary expansion, the late 19th century expansion of empire, the fact that in Salisbury you've got a prime minister who is technically vastly more able uh, than, than, than Disraeli, pushing this through and building on you know, the, those sketches of a new conservatism, of a mass party that Disraeli had begun and picking them up and carrying them forward on an extremely impressive organisational basis. Um, uh, but but, the, but I, I certainly think that the, the key to understand... I mean, Disraeli, Disraeli is a, a, a chapter of contradictions. Of course he is. He's a chapter of contradictions. Uh, but, but his later politics uh, shifts um, very much... Well, is neo Burkean rather than reactionary. And again, you see, I think this is, this, there is a reactionary element in English conservatism, but it's infinitely less than the European variety. Um, um, uh, uh, clearly, why else, uh, uh, there's no accident that Britain doesn't produce a fascism and that fascism takes, fails to take root. Um, but I, uh, what I'm really trying to do, and I, very, I was very pleased that the, the gentleman interrogated me so vigorously that we, no, no, I'm, and I'm being serious. And I do think that it's very easy. All that Blair did looks exactly as he intended it to. Modern freedom, exactly the sort of thing everybody else does. Why shouldn't we do it? I'm, I'm inviting you to consider that it might have had very bad consequences. I'm inviting you to consider that it was actually fundamentally hostile to a highly successful political tradition and that we're reaping the consequences of it. That's, that's the big thrust. Um, uh, I'm not suggesting that it's, uh, of course it's not dogma, it's a form of analysis, it's a way of trying to get you to think about it, and a way of trying to explain, as I said, why so much has gone wrong. Right. Um, just a quick, quick, quick Yes, yeah, of course, quick, please, yeah. Forgive me, the acoustic is terrible in this direction, and my hearing is elderly. Can you really speak up? Yes, yeah, sir. I was just wondering, you used the term woke, I just, but um, you mentioned it, but I don't think you defined it, and I just, just want to know what the definition is. Also, I really like what you said about the debate being fundamental, and I just wonder, it might be off topic, but I was just wondering if you have a view on the way social media is impacting um, the language and the quality of our debate. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, again, the, and this is Jonathan Haidt, whom you really ought to read, just H-A-I-D-T, look at his stuff. I mean, he is the great analyst of how the social media uh, has, and Twitter in particular, have, has, as it were, empowered pylon and the limitation of freedom of speech. Um, I, I, there are other things that I think uh, I would add to this. We are now in a world in which most things seem to work by magic. Do you understand how that thing in front of you works? Mm -hmm. uh, Only in the most... Could you repair it? No, no. <laughs> of course not. Um, and uh, everything... It, it is one of these frightening things. Again, the post office scandal it illustrates this very clearly. We confront systems which, on the one hand, claim to be perfect, and on the other hand, are profoundly flawed. Um, and I think that the, uh, we're, we're, we're in a world, I mean, if you actually think of the world that we're in now, uh, in which you can fly across the Atlantic in comfort in five hours, um, all sorts of things that until, you know, even, even when I was a boy, seem more or less magical. And because one of the most striking things about the impact of social media is that it's deprived us of a sense of reality. I think, again, one of the ways that we can understand the computer, uh, again, the classic theorists are always people one should, I think, explore. Um, the, the man who really anticipates, uh, in many ways, the social media and the impact of the screen is Plato. How many of you have read The Republic? Right. What's the great scene in The Republic, which is the obvious anticipation? Cave. The cave. Plato's cave. Um, the, the, world of the world of imagined reality which those limited to it see as the, as the real thing itself. The other thing that it seems to me that the social media have done is to test two of the great general theories of the Enlightenment, which are the two rival theories um, of the state of nature. 
who are the two great theorists of the state of nature? Hobbes and Rousseau. Hobbes and Rousseau. What does Hobbes say? Um, um, we're basically nasty, shit. We're basically brutish, shit. Yeah, yeah, short, nasty, yeah. brutish, and short. What does Rousseau say? Infinite freedom. We're lovely. We're, li we're uh, no, no, no. We're we are lovely, and it's only civilization that makes us nasty. What does the internet prove? <laughs> Hobbes is absolutely right, one hundred percent. Seems to me. Um, uh, um, so I think I think that what's important when you're looking at a, a new instrument like this is in a, is is to use the classics as a tool of analysis. I mean, I am convinced that I mean, going right back to the beginning of our civilization. Um, I mean, in England, if you look at the uh, the moment really in which the English language is invented. It's an invented language. It's Chaucer at the end of the at the end of the fourteenth century. If you look at the very beginning of the invention of the English language um, in his Parliament of Fowls, there's this extraordinary couplet in which he talks about again novelty and tradition in a most extraordinary way. And he says, just as every year from the cold old earth new corn springs, so new thoughts come from old books. It's a, you see, it's again, it's a version, it's, it's, it's wonderful, it's a version of Burke. The, the fact that the old is not like Blair, the, the, Blair the, the old is not a straitjacket, the old is not a prison. The traditions which, which, which we are used to, the, the, the world which is so wonderfully uh, depicted by T.S. Eliot in Little Gidding, uh, that world is not a prison. It's a seedbed. It's, it's an incubator. It's the th Remember, we, none of us create our culture. We inherit it. Uh, but of course, that doesn't mean it stultifies us, but it provides us with the instruments of change, of reflection, of self-knowledge, of self-understanding. Right, I'm afraid that's um, all we have time for today. Um, we've sort of overrunning now, but I'm sure there'll be um, some time to uh, ask David some more questions uh, in the round. I hope uh, he'll be joining us. Um, so uh, to conclude, I'd like to uh, please give another round of applause to David. <laughs>